Hey everyone, welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Freelander, and today on the show I have Jody Landau. Jody is a vocalist and percussionist who has created a completely unique and individual music career like no other. He has a solo act and also collaborates with LA-based ensemble Wild Up as a percussionist, vocalist, composer, and production coordinator. So often when I talk to young musicians, they tell me they like multiple things, singing, playing another instrument besides their main instrument, or playing another genre. Jody is an inspiration in this regard. From the get-go, he was navigating his career by building something all his own that doesn't look like anyone else's career out there. Today he shares the story of building his career with takeaways such as networking and connecting that leads to collaboration, navigating choosing a school that's right for you, and so much more. And if you do happen to be in Raleigh, North Carolina, you can see Jody performing with Wild Up. Check the link in the show notes for more information on their concert, which is this Friday, February 8th, in Chapel Hill, and presented by Carolina Performing Arts at Current Art Space and Studio. You can hear more about Wild Up and what they're all about in my interview with the founder and conductor, Christopher Roundtree, which released at the end of last season. But before we get started, I'd like to thank Fix Music for sponsoring Crushing Classical Podcast. Fixmusic.com is the online resource for high-quality, affordable sheet music. There are some new offerings at Fix available that you'll want to know about. Now there's organ music, a large choral selection, as well as orchestra parts that you would need for concerts or auditions. And now... They are also actively working with choral and orchestra directors to help plan seasons. So if you're a program director and you want some help on choosing pieces for your season, contact Fix Music today through their website. And as always, free shipping on all domestic orders. Check out fixmusic.com for your sheet music needs and use the link in the show notes to receive 10% off your first order. Let's get started. Welcome, Jody. So glad to have you on Crushing Classical. Thanks for having me. Lovely to chat. So great. So this is Jody Landau. Jody, I discovered you again. It's so random because I, I just am using Instagram and Facebook to find people to interview. And I had just interviewed Christopher Roundtree not too long ago, and so I I follow him and and we had such a great conversation. And I saw I think I saw you collaborating with him or some other thing that. Um, that I found you and I started looking at what you do and I was like, oh my gosh, who's this person? And I just reached out on Instagram direct message and you wrote, wrote right back. So that was really great. I love doing that. It's like, it seems yeah. so like there's no boundaries to contact people anymore. You know, you can yeah. just... The internet is certainly great for certain things, for certain especially things. connecting connecting musicians around the world together. Yeah, so great. And then, so so tell me a little bit about what you do so that people listening can kind of have a context for your unique style. Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I am a vocalist and composer, percussionist, quasi-keyboardist, um, sometimes copyist uh, for a lot of some close knit uh, new music composers and collaborators. Um, I do a little bit of administrative work uh, within Wild Up, who I work with. Um, and I work with them as, as admin and composer and performer. Um, and I also work with uh, Bedroom Community, which is the label in Iceland that uh, Wild Up and I released our, our album on a few years ago called You of All Things, which we recorded in, in Iceland with um, an Icelandic female choir called Graduali Nobili. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. And the whole time you're talking, I'm just thinking, talk about redefining what a music career can look like, you know? Like there's sure. nobody else that has Jody Landau's exact career out there, you know? Yeah, which which is both a, a wonderful thing and and an intimidating thing. <laughs> How is it intimidating? You know, I think I think it can be tricky to either in my own personal trajectory or even in just explaining what it is that mm. that I do, um, that I don't quite have a model to point to to say, this person, you know what they do, I do that. Right. Um, I have many people who I can point, I can point to like six different people and what I do is some combination of what they do. Um, but because I, you know, like I do make in terms of my financial life like my work is often primarily from 
wild up and copying work. Mm. Um, but then also work as a soloist, both within wild up and separately. Um, uh, but yeah, so my, my daily schedule and routine is, is constantly in flux as, as it is for many freelance musicians. But the, I think the things that I'm sort of freelancing in are, are, are quite, um, widespread, right, um, all right. within something that feels consistent to me and all feels like it, it sort of fuels the same, um, energies and education and et cetera. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's so it's certainly all related, but it can be you know I can go from having a week where I'm doing 15 hour days of just sitting at my computer making a score look pretty, and other days where I'm performing consistently or writing a lot or recording a lot or doing admin work or painting our muslin sheet programs that we we paint uh, for Wild Up. So it's 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 a uh, it's it's a bit of a scattered schedule. Um, yeah. But, but it's, it's pretty wonderful, I must say. Well, it's interesting because you said freelance. And so that's <laughs> like, that's a typical term that everyone uses who doesn't have a full-time job with a symphony. But you're right. you're sort of a contemporary musician and also a classical musician. You kind of described yourself as a contemporary classical crossover, something like that musician to me. And, and I thought, yeah, that's really, you kind of have like one foot in in one world and one foot in another. And then the work that you do is actually with what I call like the classical music disruptor crowd, mm. you know, like, and it's small, but growing. And I would say Christopher Roundtree is definitely one of the leaders in that movement, regardless of if it's recognized as that. Mm. Um, it's, I think that's more and more, more and more people are going to start going in that direction where they, you know, they have this career as a classical musician, playing symphonies, you know, freelancing with orchestras, or maybe they had a job and they decided to leave or, or whatever else. And what's cool about you is that you, you weren't necessarily going in that path to be a classical musician in an orchestra. Like you've, mm. you've always from the start been developing your own unique career path and voice and everything, which is so unique, um, especially to this podcast, which is why I wanted to have you on. So can you tell us a little more about, like, well, how did you get your start as a musician? You know, you're, you said you're a vocalist and a percussionist. Like, give us the whole story and background of how, how you got there. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I grew up always, uh, an excuse, excuse me, you might hear occasionally my, uh, my dog barking in the background. Um, so apologies for that. But, uh, uh, so yeah, so I started, you know, at a young age, always singing and performing. Um, I come from a very, uh, performative family and, uh, a family based in, in creating the arts and, and performance. Um, you know, my, my mom was a singer, uh, is a singer. My aunt is a playwright and director. She would put on productions for my cousin's birthday parties that my brother and I would star in acting as our cousins in some uh, fantastical story or fairy tale. Um, you know, I was always dancing and singing around to Backstreet Boys and Chicago the Musical and things like that. Um, and to me, it was sort of a, a big moment in my musical career and education was um, I played a little bit of percussion in, in elementary school and then I was singing in jazz band okay. uh, in middle school and my teacher, you know, put his hand on his head and was like, what are you doing? You're trying to scat. Like, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so, but do you know what? You're a percussionist. Why don't you play vibraphone? And he said, you know, my, my dad plays vibes, so you should play vibes and you should study with him. Um, and so I did. Um, and so I ended up taking up lessons with um, Ivan Johnson's father, who's David Johnson, who later was my teacher at, at CalArts when I went there. Um, and yeah, so then suddenly I was, I was lucky enough to, in middle school, elementary school, middle school, high school, have all these opportunities to perform and be exposed to also a, lots of different kinds of, of music making. Um, and so, you know, was always going to concerts, um, felt very much was fortunate to, to be in LA and have both a community of performances around me and also teachers and 
collaborators from a very young age. Um, I went to, at the high school I went to, there, Ivan uh, Johnson uh, co-founded the uh, Academy of Creative Education, which was at during the summer. Um, and it was a four long, four week long program where I got to, you know, work with vocal teachers and composition teachers and play in a jazz ensemble with Vinnie Golia or play in a percussion quartet or have an ensemble of fellow students and faculty playing music that I was writing. Oh, wow. Uh, so it's, you're really, it was really, um, you, you were allowed to merge the vocal side of, of what you were doing with the percussion side and the, and the composer side as well. Did you know, did you start writing once you were at that program, that summer program? Um, yeah. So I, I, I think, uh, another one of my moments with, with Ivan, again, Ivan was in, in middle school, I was in a, you know, kind of rock band mm -hmm. and we recorded a piece that I was so happy with. It had a, an extended saxophone solo and the bridge and then I had a faster kind of punk rock end um, and I felt really proud of it and I brought it into Ivan and he listened to it and he just sat there and he took out a pen and paper and he drew for a second and he said, do you know what this is? And I looked at it and goes, it's a box and you're inside it. Harsh. And, a little harsh. And it, <laughs> and, it, and it was a big harsh moment but also a very inspiring moment. Um, and while I was so proud of myself at the time, I also sort of knew what he meant and actually went home that night and bought F Finale. Um, and I, I now use Sibelius. But uh, I, bought, I bought Finale that night and started writing sort of an extended version of what that piece was um, and had a bunch of odd meters and... Um, added some new harmonies and sort of slowly began trying things out in a different way than what I could achieve being in just a rock band with other people who are, um, you know, guitarist, bassist, drummer. Um, right. but then as I started writing for writing things that I couldn't necessarily play or they couldn't necessarily play. Um, um yeah, so I, I really began, as I started using Finale and notating music out, I really started to take advantage of the community of musicians who were around me, both the students that I was working with and the faculty, both during the school year and over the throughout the summer program, um, and really started learning what it is to notate music and to perform it with improvisers and to perform it with contemporary classical musicians um, and jazz musicians and, and all different types of, of people from different backgrounds and, and ages. Um, okay. So you kind, of, you kind of went into it and thought, okay, breaking out of the mode that I'm in playing with band, my band, you were like, okay, let's think about jazz and even classical. Yeah, because I, I mean, the, certainly the music at the, at the time, you know, throughout middle school and, and the beginning of high school as I was sort of finding the things that I musically that I really gravitated towards a lot of the types of music were often um, experimental in, in some regard and whether it was, you know, part, part of, I consider part of my music education was driving to school with my brother when I was in middle school. Um, Cause he was, and, what he was listening to. And, and what he was listening to. And part of, part of what we did is we wouldn't even talk for most of the drive. We would just, he would blast music and over several months, I got to know it all. And then we wouldn't speak, but we would like sing in octaves with each other, you know, um, singing along to, you know, Mars Volta or King Crimson or Bjork or um, Mr. Bungle. Um, I, don't and so know any, were, I don't know any of those artists. Oh, great. Except Bjork. Well, uh, yeah, but I uh, hi highly, highly recommend, um, you know, and they're they're all sort of within this, within each of their own sound worlds, like slightly progressive okay. um, in, in, in some way, whether that's like prog, literally prog rock or just somewhat something alternative or something unique um, within their instrumentation, their style, their theatrics, etc. Um, so between that and then being 
both at this school, Oakwood, and the Summer Program Academy of Creative Education, uh, and just being being in LA and having places like Red Cat and Disney Hall um, as places that I went frequently throughout the week. Mm-hmm. Um, they were these incredible resources of all this new music that I had never heard and all of this experimentation. Um, and so it really created this wonderful surrounding for me to just go, I, I want to create things like that, or I want to mirror it or, um, yeah, I want to, I want to create an event that feels like, um, or create music that, that feels like both a circus and a concert (laughs) at the same time. Um, you know, something that's just like crazy and loud and bombastic and something that's beautiful and intimate. Um, and so seeing, seeing things that were that far spread apart, but being made by all these skilled, intelligent, intuitive people, um, was, was really, really inspiring. That's so cool. So did you, you just described like that you wanted it to be loud and bombastic and peaceful and circus like and intimate and all these things. So did you have like a specific vision for what you would want a performance to be like? Is that, did you kind of formulate that in your mind and then go about creating it or what was the next step after, after that? I mean, I I think, I think uh, that's a good question. I think maybe that intentionality came a little bit later okay. um, and it's certainly something that I'm uh, more aware of or mindful of at, at the current moment mm-hmm. um, but I think yeah at the time part partially it was just seeing you know my, my brother had a band and also with uh, Ivan Johnson at Oakwood and with uh, fellow students such as Ethan Gruska um, uh, they made a pop opera um, that was a major musical inspiration for me. Um, and it was just sort of a short, like 60 minute little pop rock opera that they made in my brother's senior year of high school. Um, and so, you know, it was seeing things like that, that had, you know, a drum set and a cello next to each other. Um, and was playing this music that I really related to and that I liked to sing along with. And that was very performative, um, and coming from, you know, a bit of a theatrical family, that was something that I very much related to. So I think that um, that just naturally was a part of my music, that it was, mu- you know, music for music's sake, but also like kind of performative and about the act of performing it. Um yeah, it's so and, much more of a of the like the whole pie, if you know what I mean. Like mm-hmm. like you're like you're talking about all of your influences and the music that your brother listened to and when you were a little kid like listening to musicals and and being maybe kind of silly and just performing it in front of your family but like yeah. having the influence of your family that worked in in kind of performance venue didn't you say your dad was in in the in film yeah yeah so, so like my, you my were, dad's a producer yeah yeah so you were exposed to all this other entertainment industry that's outside of just listening, you you know, my mom listened to classical music when I was a kid. It's like so many more different ways that it's coming into your life that yeah. is informing, but it's good to hear you that you say that the intentional way of thinking of it didn't come until later. So you're like, basically you're kind of collecting, you know, your experiences over time and sort of designing sort of an idea of what you would want it to look like and and then so did, would you say that led you to collaborating with um wild up because you saw them or how did how did that connection with wild up get created um s- sort of through several ways um and i feel very fortunate that many of the collaborations that i have have all kind of just been very organic uh-huh. um but certainly, I would say it started at at Oakwood and and at Cal Arts. There's a big at Oakwood. There was a community at the summer arts program and throughout the year of Cal Arts alum and faculty that I worked with, um, many of whom are have worked with Wild Up or still work with Wild Up. Mm-hmm. Um, so many of the players that I recruited when I was in my senior year of high school and I did a college audition CD 
where I wrote um, sort of three different pieces, one more of a jazz tune, one more of a Mr. Bungley, King, King crimson Charles Mingus, 10-minute rock, jazz, funk thing, and one like a contemporary classical chamber music piece um, that a lot of those people um, are still in, still play with Wild Up or I still work with today. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I feel grateful to have, have been in LA and, and stayed in LA and so closely tied to that community. Um, but I'd say I, I really became a part of the group about uh, five, six years ago. Um, I, I had worked with Chris and Wild Up um, at, at Cal Arts. We did a, a Sophia Gubaidalina piece on a festival, a week long festival of her music that uh, Chris conducted. And so I had originally met him there. Um, and then I loosely began playing in some of the shows. And it wasn't until um, June 1st, 2013, uh, actually, that I uh, really was invited to like truly be part of the group. Um, I did a project with Wild Up and the industry called First Take. And I was, I was helping my friend Ellen Reed out on her uh, opera, which they were presenting excerpts ep- excerpts of, um, and I I wanted to learn to how to use Sibelius, and so I was helping her out and helping make parts of the group, and ended up they needed a third percussionist, so I played percussion, um, and it was sort of through through that performance and experience that it was made clear that Chris took me aside and was like, oh wait, I think you need to be a part of this thing. Um, and so since then, I've been collaborating much more directly with the group, um, including going going to Iceland on our, our on our project together, um, and as well as touring these last couple years. Um, and as I mentioned, working as kind of what I've been calling admin flux flux admin staff. Um, yeah. So what do you what do you do for that? Um, so at at this moment, we we just had. Um, one of our other percussionists, Matt Cook, wonderful, wonderful human being, uh, step in as as more of the official production coordinator um, than than myself, um, as well as working on development. Um, so I'm maybe I think back to my admin flux, but I do. I've described in in my history of the last five years of working with Wild Up, it's been anything from at first I was, you know, helping out with grant applications or just you know setting up chairs at rehearsal. Um, to also now being one of the kind of primary painters of our muslin sheet uh, banners that we that we paint for our as our program. Um, so what is that? Is, what is what is so, a muslin sheet program? So it is we we paint using stencils. Okay. Um, and so my understanding, I wasn't I wasn't there for the 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 start of it but what i've taken away from it that i really love about it is so often when you're at a concert the program becomes this thing that sits in your lap you're listening to the show at a moment of maybe disconnect or boredom or <laughs> yeah something you just like open it up and start to read it and you're hearing the you know people in the audience you hear the pages of it you hear this and it's a way of potentially disconnecting from I agree. The moment that you're in. Yeah. Uh, and so what, what I understand this to be is it's, it's a way of showing here's what the program is, but in a much less formal way, in an, in an arty way where you look at it and you see, you, you can tell that it took 10 hours to make it. Mm-hmm. You know, so there, there's something behind it that, and, it, and it's a little messy and it's a little imperfect. Um, and there's, there's a beauty in that. Um, so, but it's weird. so you're take you you hand out a uh, like a little piece of fabric to everybody that was stenciled on. So we hang a five foot, five and a half foot wide by sometimes twelve feet long. Oh, okay. Huge. I mean, so it's it's quite a large, um, it's quite a large piece of, of fabric. So this so was well thought out. You guys were like, wait, we don't want people picking up a program in the middle and disconnecting with what their experience is. We want to change that. Yeah, and so and we paint everybody's name in the band, uh-huh. uh, uh, and and initially it started as like we would all hang out and you know twenty of us would all paint together and 
and drink and eat and, and, and be merry and listen to music. Um, but more recently it's become a bit of a, a a more intimate job of of just me or, or maybe a few other people, um, just because it is time consuming and sometimes hard to rally everybody into a room to paint. Um, but yeah, so it's, I think, I think it's part of it is, is giving credit to everybody and having their name kind of bright and bold and, and painted, um, as well as, you know, we, we sometimes hang it behind us on the stage if we're performing on a stage, or we'll sometimes, uh, even we've taped it to the floor so that as you walk into a space, it gets to a certain point where you actually even have to walk on top of the program. So there's something a little bit like, fun and transgressive about that of like, no, but the program's so holy or our names are so holy, but like, no, 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 step all over us. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So th- it's certainly, that's, that's a part of wild up that I very much enjoy on the artistic conceptual level. And just for the catharsis of painting for 10 hours and having, you know, like I'm, I'm not a good painter. I'm not a good <laughs> visual artist, but like I can do stencils. Right. So there's something very beautiful and like elementary and, and rudimentary about it. Um, and something very fun and it's, it's a beautiful activity and meditative and, um, and very satisfying. And and so different from it. like the orchestra world where a program gets printed in some office by some person who doesn't know you and doesn't know your name and doesn't even know that you play your instrument or whatever, or maybe you don't get put in the program cause you're not your sub or whatever, you know, <laughs> like it's not, it's, it's, con- it's, you're connecting the, the messaging that you create about what you're doing to the audience in another way yeah. besides talking to them. I think it's cool. It's really, it's really unique. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So, so as you were talking about meeting Christopher and, and teaming up with wild up and everything, you were talking about, um, going to performances and getting to know people and, you know, Cal arts and, and remind me of the summer program that was, that you ACE, did. ACE Academy of creative education. Okay. Are these, are these still going, is that still going on? It, it is. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I'll link it in the show notes because people might be interested in Great, checking yeah. it out. Um, but like I get this, I'm getting a lot of, a lot from you about your community, like you, how you've built your community and, and network. I mean, it sounds more like a community than like networking. Like I'm going out to meet people so I can get gigs. Like it's so much more of, it sounds like you, I mean, I could be wrong. I don't know, but it sounds like you have a point of view about how important that is. So I want to know, like, did you, did someone teach it to you? Did you come up with it yourself? Like, are you, was it just natural that you're like, I need to meet people or, or how did that kind of come about? Um, you know, I, I assume it, it mainly started with, with, you know, especially I think about when I got, you know, my license and a car. Okay. Um, and the amount of both, you know, freedom and, and privilege that came with that, but of, of being able to, you know, there was, there was a time period, the end of high school, beginning of college, where I'd say minimum four week, four nights out of the week, if not more. I was at a show in LA. Wow. Um, and I, I don't know at what point that switched over or cro- blended with the idea of like, oh, so that I can meet people and network, which I, I don't quite have that, but, but that's, that's in there at some point. But I think it really just started with, I just loved being out and being inspired. And, you know, there was certainly a time period where everything I saw inspired me. Mm-hmm. I was just blown away by everything um, and yeah and 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 became known in the community just mainly by being the person who I'd show up at a concert and, and everybody's like who who are you you're just <laughs> you're this like every concert young kid you look 12 years old but you're like at everything and you're always smiling <laughs> that's um, a good I reputation just, to have to, absolutely and 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 for many people within this community that I'm in now, like that was, I, and I remember somebody literally saying that to me, like, who are you and why are you always smiling? <laughs> um, and it's cause in those circumstances, like that's where I was happy and comfortable and, 
and inspired. And so why wouldn't I be smiling? I was stoked to be surrounded by, you know, cool musicians or art or things that I, you know, made me want to go home and then stay up till four in the morning and write and make wow. music or perform or, um, yeah. You so it sounds so like, I, it sounds like, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it just sounds no, like please. the, the, the environment that you had, I want to know a little bit more about Cal Arts because it sounds like the environment was so nourishing that you um, were just always in this state of flow. Like you, like to be able to say, I'm going to go to four concerts a week, regardless if you're like, and you definitely weren't like, I need to go to four concerts. It was just like a natural thing where you're like, I'm going to these concerts and then you get so inspired and happy that you go home and write music. Like that's, I would call a state of flow where everything feels easy and I'm not saying easy like it never was work for you but easy in the in the way that you were inspired and it was fun for you um yeah and that that kind of being surrounded by an environment that fosters that I would say is really important especially as you're coming of age coming out of high school and into your 20s I can say that that wasn't how I felt in college Mm. as a music major because I was coming out of high school going, now I can finally focus on horn. I want to, I want to focus on playing my instrument. And then suddenly I had to take all these really hard theory and history classes and study and memorize dates and, and all these things that made me feel like, oh, this isn't much different from high school, except for it's not chemistry. It's, yeah. you know, really hard theory that I don't understand or whatever, you know? So, um, I would say it's, it wasn't fostering the create creative side for me. And so like, so did you get that at Cal arts? Was that what was like, what's going on at Cal arts? <laughs> you know, cause there, it sounds, it's such, it sounds like such a cool place. Yeah. I mean, certainly I, I got that both at Cal arts and I think from Cal arts in terms of the branches that extended out of it. And that mm-hmm. certainly I was, I had access to in, in high school um, and in, in middle school, um, there was literally, it used to be the Wednesday um, sort of special studies class at, at my high school. At, at its initial point was called the, like the Cal Arts Hour or something like that um, because it was mostly taught by Cal Arts alum. Um, uh, anyway, um, yeah, so, so I think. I think it, it, it certainly extends from CalArts, but is also comes from even just, you know, I, I've thought a lot about the way that my, my parents always approached music with me, um, at least especially once I was into middle school, high school, and the amount of support that they gave me to say, any lessons that you want, we will provide. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really feel like I, especially in that time, took a, as great of an advantage of that as I could. Um, and I probably had, you know, at one point, four private lessons a week. Oh, wow. In, you know, I had my, a singing teacher, I had a composition teacher, I had a, my percussion teacher, I had, uh, I was doing aural skills and ear training. And the difference between my level of interest and attention in things that I was specifically choosing to schedule in my days and in my week was a different thing than, than an obligation. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, you know, as, as a younger kid, uh, you know, when I had piano lessons, like I wish I took those more seriously and I, I wish I'd become a better pianist, but at the time I didn't, have I didn't know why I wanted to be right. doing exactly why right. I wanted to do piano lessons or what I wanted to get out of it um, in the way that I got to a point where I recognized why I was excited about doing ear training mm. and working on singing in different modes and transcribing things. You had a purpose. I saw, you had a purpose. I had a purpose, for and I saw I saw its direct relation to wanting to be a better composer, wanting to be a better jazz improviser. Right. um, And also just really liked my teacher, uh, this guy, Richie Cohen, who um, is a wonderful composer and wrote for this group, Hour of the Shipwreck, which I was in love with. So, you know, it was was somebody whose music inspired me and I felt like I was getting so much from him. Um, Or, you know, my teacher, Kate 
Conklin, who later in high school and through my uh, time over the last like kind of eight eight years or so, um, have studied voice and Alexander technique with her. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, so to, so to me, it's it was all of the the education by choice that really stuck with me, mm. and and because I had access to that both as a conceptual idea and just because I had the types of, of educational experiences that I had at such an early age, the wonderful thing about getting to CalArts when I did was being able to, you know, be a student, but also be in, in certain moments that I wasn't even ready for, but be put in a circumstance where I was a performer. Mm. And it wasn't just, oh, you're a student. I was like doing the gig. And it was a get, and we had a show at Red Cat, and there was an audience, and it wasn't, you know, just an audience who was there to hear, oh, yes, we're going to hear this recital of this percussion quartet. Right. It was like, no, like, we're getting LA Times reviews from our show because Mark Sweat is there, or, you know, there's, there's, there's a community outside of academia that was there, and it, and it meant something greater than, than just education itself. Wow, that's um, cool. And so I think that to me was was really important and something that I needed as a as a performer and also as a composer. I actually because um, I, I went to USC for a very brief semester as a composition major, mm. and um, it's a wonderful place. And I'm so glad that I went, and I'm glad that I went for the time that I went because I needed to know why. I was so much a, a part of the Cal Arts community already that I, I wanted to stay in LA and I wanted to have access to, you know, these wonderful musicians, um, including, you know, one I still with, play with today in Wild Up, Brian Walsh, who's one of my favorite players on the planet. He's a clarinetist and saxophonist um, and just one of the best improvisers and players. And, um, and to have somebody like him in my freshman year of, of college say, if you write it, we will come. Wow. You know that that was a community. I, how could I leave and you know go to Michigan or go right. to New York or or go somewhere else? I I had to stay in LA, but I wanted to go to get out of the Cal Arts bubble a bit. Um, and it was important to go and then realize why I needed to be at Cal Arts. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I really wanted to. I was somebody had asked me to put on a concert at the Pasadena Library um, that April, and I had talked at USC about maybe doing a concert there. And that's just not something they really do, especially for a freshman. Right. Like as a composition major, no, 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 we wait, we do more recital, of like third, more like fourth year. And to me, I, I just felt like I don't care to write music unless it's going to be performed. Because right. I'm, a, I'm a performer first, really. And my, a lot of my point behind composing is, is creating a vehicle for myself or for others to, to perform. Um, and to me, I've learned the most from my experiences of putting something together and having a real true deadline and people, you know, especially at a young age, which now it's become less of a pressure, but especially then was a big pressure of like, oh, these are amazing musicians who are about to play my music. I need to make this worth their while. Yeah. So tell me about that. Cause you, enjoy it. yeah. Yeah. Cause you, you did a project you said it was because you told me about this on our other conversation about um, a CD that you had to make for was this for an audition? Was that for Cal Arts or for uh, Southern California? Yeah, so it was. So initially, I was applying everywhere as a as a composition major. So okay. it, you know, I I applied to Juilliard and Michigan and uh, uh, University of Miami and USC and Cal Arts and blah blah blah, um, and. So in making my college audition CD, you know, I, I could have tried to make some some smaller thing. But at the time, I was really inspired and really wanted to have, you know, a full string section and a brass section and woodwind section and percussion and drums and all the things. Um, and, and was so fortunate to be able to have that be a part of my education um, and, and something that my my parents were so kind enough to support and show me why they were supporting it Mm -hmm. and saying that they, you know, believed that it was 
an investment in in my education and in my career um and and for me it was one a way of a way for me to learn of like what it means to rally a bunch of musicians together both the the costs of it as well as just how to communicate with people and what certain people need and some people just need the email and that's it and other people wanted to talk for 40 minutes about what the what I was working on and why and you know they needed an in for just the like measly 50 bucks I was going to give them um and but so one that was a big way of how I got to know a lot of the musicians that again that I still work with today um and got to learn from them and work with them directly and have them say, oh, Joe, do you know this section on violin where you wrote these octaves? It's actually really hard to do it like this, but maybe if you wrote it like this, it would be clearer or cleaner or better or easy for me to play. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and yeah, and really gave me, one, uh, the, the need and excitement to be, to, to care about notation and to care about what people what m- sort of my players were as a composer were receiving for me so that they felt that they could play it the best. Cause you know, as a young composer, sometimes my parts weren't as clean and luckily I have a community of people who are very vocal about that. And so every time it became this thing of every time I worked with them, one, I was hoping that hopefully the pay would get better at some point, but especially that if not the music itself would get better and the way it looked would be better and the experience and and I, I've been really into like, even if I can't pay you, I got to feed you. And, you know, like, how can I keep players who are gracing me with playing my music? How can I keep those people happy? Right. Um, and so it was, it was a learning experience on, on, on so many, so many levels um, that then culminated in a, at the end of that year, the day after I graduated, um, did, a, did a full concert. Um, uh, with yeah, like twenty twenty five piece ensemble and drums and guitar and conductor and um, and a, it was a whole whole big thing. Um, but to me, that really felt like my biggest moment of 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 my education um, because it was a real thing. It was a you know performance. It had an audience. Um, it was stressful. It had a deadline. It yeah. taught me a lot about money and a lot about time management, um, and a lot about delegating, um, and felt grateful that I had, you know, could show up slightly late to the rehearsal and one of the pieces still isn't finished. And then one of my <laughs> teachers can run off and, and like help fix the finale parts and then print them and format them. Cause I screwed them up, you know, things like that, the like, you know, and have to cut a piece the day of the show because I didn't finish the arrangement. And um, uh, yeah, I, I sort of I needed that that type of pressure, but with with ultimately with with such wonderful payoffs of even just you know the feedback of an audience or really introducing myself into the community of musicians that I wanted to be playing with and and working for and et cetera. It's awesome. It's yeah. really, it sounds like such a great experience. Um, so if you had to kind of boil down some of the like most important takeaways from that experience, what would you say that they were? Mm. Uh, from, from the experience of, of, of doing the, the like group. college audition, building the group. Yeah. Um, ooh, That's a good question. I mean, I think, I think for me, the 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 biggest takeaways were um, throughout, including that experience and and the several over the next several years prior. Um, I think it was a combination of one, the amount, just knowing that like I learned endlessly more every time I did something real mm-hmm. that that felt real to me. Um, and and learned on so many levels from from what it what it meant for me to perform and what it it took logistically and financially, et cetera. Um, and then also what I could how I could best interact with the with the people that I was working with, uh-huh. you know, especially at a at a certain point where 
I realized, you know, as a young composer hiring people for like a short film score that got delayed, just getting into realizing that like, oh, I didn't communicate enough with a person mm -hmm. to make them feel good about me and about themselves. And now they think that I specifically ousted them in a way that I didn't want, you know, so even on, on that level of, of, of keeping your, your employees or your musicians or your collaborators happy mm -hmm. of, you know, what, what it, what it meant from, from that level of, in terms of being that the person hiring them, as well as being the composer making music that looked yeah. good for them on the page. Um, so I think th those were a lot of the, the big takeaways of, of, to me, the things of like, I care about, other people's happiness and I want people to if any if if only you know even just selfishly of I want these people to want to work with me again yeah um and so and so thinking about all the things that 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 takes as well as then you know how to how to best put myself in in a position that I can succeed um and so learning from oh you know I I did take too much on my plate or I could have delegated this better um, right. instead of trying to do all of it myself. Maybe like this arrangement I can get somebody else to do because I have enough pieces to write on my own or I need to get sleep the night before performing because <laughs> I'm also singing in the show. Right. But I also like, stayed up one, you know, like partying a little bit because I had just graduated the night before and also like still finishing the arrangements. Um, so there were, to me, there were, those were the, I, I'd say the the big things. So like keeping how how to interact with with people that I'm working with, how to keep them happy, how to keep them excited, and and how to you know honor myself and the process um, right. and get get the most out of it. Great answers, because yeah. like it's it's hard to tell how you're communicating with people until probably you make a mistake and you get feedback exactly. about that, or like and especially the self care one, you know is from, I think what I hear you saying is that like, you of course want this to be great and I, I'll do the same thing, push myself a little too, too far to the point where I'm not remembering, okay, like I need to make, I need to plan to eat lunch in the day or like make exactly. sure that I go to bed at time on time, you know, and everything. So that's really great. And you know, um, I, I hear you on just, there's certain things I'm discovering as I build my ensemble, like, um, just being organized and organizing it's a struggle because you think you're organized until suddenly like you have three different email threads going about the same rehearsals exactly. and you're like, wait, what, what, what just happened? You know, like why? And then someone's going to miss one and it's just too messy. Like there's gotta be better ways to figure these out. Like just out of curiosity, what did you do when you were planning rehearsals? Did you say the rehearsals are Monday, Wednesday, and the following Tuesday, and the concerts on Wednesday? Like, did you did you do that, or did you try to get people's availability and try to match it up? Since you were probably not paying them very much, right. how did you navigate that? Uh, good, good question. I think at the time in high school, I think there were there were certainly specific dates in terms of one, you know, when we were recording, when the studio was available. Um, also like my availability at school and, and would use the school as, as, as a rehearsal space during, during the night. Um, so there were, there were outside factors that I think did at the time uh, create a bit more of a strict schedule so that I was just sending everybody here are the dates. Mm -hmm. um, certainly over the last several years, what I've, gotten into is a, a combination of just telling people here's when the dates are yeah, and making sure with the, with the few people, like I know, okay, I want to work with this clarinetist and this violinist and these singers. So I'm going to ask them first, right. If they're available during this time frame, And if they are, I'm going to like, there are people that I, I prioritize because right. I know, this is my favorite person. They're going to make this music better, or I actually really need this vocalist because of it. You know, so depending on on the circumstances, sometimes I will get people's availability. Because you can't say to twenty five people, "I need everybody's availability," because it's going to be like very few. No, that's that's too much. Right. But so that's a really good point. With, if I am working with twenty five people and there are four of them that need to be a part of it, 
Yeah. I'll get their availability right. and then hire everybody else in based on um, that. Ba- based on that. Um, That's great advice. And look, yeah, and, and and luckily now now it's at a point where my community is 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 spread out enough and and wide enough and broad enough that that I, I don't need to do that as much. And I know at the end of the day, if that one person isn't available, I can, I can find somebody else. Right. Um, but, but it's also, I definitely through, especially now through traveling more and playing with, with different people, there is a certain comfort that I have with just walking into a room with the community that I'm a part of or that I've built or, that's formed around me and just handing them a piece of paper that they know exactly what to do with. And I don't need to explain it. That's, that's really wonderful. So having people who have both the, the type of education that, you know, and, and just life experiences, but also just know me and know what my intentions with the music are or know what I mean when I'm telling them to take these three notes and improvise off of them. Right. And, um, and with Wild Up, like, probably by now you've got an established, it's pretty established. So you know that there's people who are prioritizing Wild Up in their, in their schedule. So right. which is, which is a great place to be. That's, that's where I am looking forward to being, you know, that they, you know, that the people who are involved know they're going to get paid a certain amount. So they're not going to lose money by um, playing with you. And so that's like probably one of the biggest hurdles once, once you've got that kind of established, I, I would think, you know? Yeah. And, and certainly, I mean, there was definitely, I've, I wasn't as much of a part of it at, at that time. Um, but you know, there certainly were the years where as Wild Up was forming, um, and I think both like my career and, and Wild Up's career are, are, are somewhat related mm-hmm. and, and very much intertwined, um, but but the points where you know the gigs didn't pay that much and just you know paying for um, you know paying whether it's paying a hundred bucks or fifty bucks to somebody like that's actually not paying them what they're worth right you know that's like gas money um, and so part of it is is giving them enough of 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 other ends so that they they feel like it's worth it and also yeah hopefully the trajectory that by a certain point and mm-hmm. you know as as we're in I guess as wild up is in sort of year nine now, um, you know, that, that, that looks like a different thing and people's needs are different. Um, people's just even ability to be able to commit and say like, I'm going to take this gig for 50 bucks isn't there as much. And so it's, it's this, this wonderful thing of like, hopefully we're all becoming more successful that we can all use each other more and pay each other more. Mm -hmm. Um, but but that just becomes another uh, another point of like learning and and b- I think boundary setting of you know like what what somebody can give to somebody else for however much money or pay or um, so so I, I find that all also very very fascinating and and relevant both within Wild Up and within my life and um, both in and outside of my career. Yeah, it is. Um, I think <clears throat> I think. You know, in my experience so far, some of the people that have said, uh, I mean, to be honest, everybody that has said they'll work with me on Contempo, my my new group that's starting up. Mm -hmm. I I actually get (laughs) last weekend, it was like our first rehearsal leading up to our very first concert. And I got kind of emotional because I was like, why do these people trust me? Why do they? You know what I mean? And then I and then I realized this is fun for everybody. Just I'm creating it, but they're having a good time. And it's right. not, I'm I'm definitely committed, and I keep telling them that I'm committed to this not being like something I'm going to keep asking them to play for free. I, I'm really committed to raising money and making it a a thing that I can pay. But like, it's just really great when you stepping outside of the I do this thing and I get paid for it. And how much does the gig pay? And I'll say yes if it pays enough to justify me getting a babysitter or turning down right. another job or whatever. Like you do that for a number of years and you can get to the point where you like don't believe that people want to do something just for musical satisfaction anymore. It's it's sort of right. sad to, to admit, but it becomes a job at a certain point, especially as you get older. And so it's nice to, that's what I find so really invigorating about what you do is that it doesn't, it never went that way. Like it was starting from the beginning, you were creating your own voice. I think a mm. lot of times musicians 
because I'm just speaking for myself and talking about myself right now, is that I went to a, a certain path, traditional path, and then got to a point where I was like, well, what is my voice? Am I creative? Am right. I a creator? Am I an artist? Or am I just an operator of an instrument that gets hired to do specific, really specific things? And I didn't, I wasn't happy with just saying, I guess I just operate this machinery, this piece of metal that, you know, I'll play fourth horn on an opera. If you call me to do it, I can show up and do a good job. And no one will notice because I'm not going to screw up and then it, everyone's going to be happy and then I'll leave and yeah. I'll get a check. You know what I mean? So like at a certain point I was like, I just, that's not enough for me, you know? And so like for musicians, and I think my story is probably much more common than yours, unfortunately, because I don't think people are generally um, led at the at an early age. And I think a lot of it has to do with your upbringing and where you, the fact that you yeah. grew up in LA and all that really cool stuff. So like, um, I wonder, and I don't know if you do, but if you have any advice for musicians like me and other people, other classical musicians who who do want to find their own voice, who do want to be creators and artists and find that within themselves, regardless of what their career path has ended up, do you have any mm. advice for, you know, just kind of finding that? Um, I think possibly yes and no. Um, I, I, or maybe more like I have a, have a response. I think maybe I'm a little wary of of, of saying of saying advice just because yeah. as if it's coming from a place that, you know, as if I worked really hard to find my own voice, um, and more so I feel aware that like, of how what a wonderful and and privileged life I've led in that there's been I I was kind of just given such a wonderful nurturing um, that. I was always able to find my voice or, yeah. or, or like always in search of it. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a little different to, to speak toward anybody if it's coming at all from a place of like looking for that. Um, but I, I think, I think to me, the branching off of, as you were speaking, several things that came up for me were, um, uh, band mentality, um, and thinking of, like when you're when you're asking people to to opt in, whether that's you for for your group or me in some of the experiences I've had, where it's like, hey, you know, this gig doesn't really pay much, and it, and it's the idea of of when you're getting people to opt in, and they're choosing to make the music, that's a really beautiful special feeling. Yeah. Um, and I think it it's a certain type of music making, and it's something that I'm very much. Uh, fascinated by and and curious about how to always maintain that mentality even in the circumstances where like hopefully everybody's getting paid as much as possible because like that's what we want to hopefully do for each other like we yeah. want to make livings yeah. um and so so i think i think to me it's that's that's one of the things in my career so to speak and in my life that i feel really grateful for that almost everything i do I'm there, like the pay. If I'm getting paid, the payment is a nice little bonus, and 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 I'm you know I've worked toward doing more things that pay me and more consistently, and um and trying to you know not do just things for free. But I think w once I'm in the room, it's great that I'm getting a paycheck, but I want to be there. Yeah. Um. And and I and and I feel grateful for that. I feel grateful that I'm a part of a community that I, that I want to be with, that I am surrounded by music and musicians and composers that I want to make music with. Um, and, and so I think that to me has been a really wonderful and joyous thing. And I think does translate into my performance. And I think is, is one of the things that people respond to in, in my voice or in my performance it's the amount of like joy and passion that there is. Mm. Uh, and I think that's, that's attractive on anybody. So maybe it's just allowing yourself to seek that out in yourself, like permission yeah. for, you know. And, and, and I think to whatever extent that is, I, you know, I was just telling the story um, a few days ago about, I was, I was seeing a violin concerto at, at Disney hall several years ago. And it's really intense piece in the bridge of the violinist's violin broke. Mm. 
Oh my gosh. In the middle of the performance. So they did the thing, you know, the first violin gives them their violin and then the person behind them gives them their violin and the per- you know. Uh-huh. And so it there was a, then this woman sitting on the on the aisle of the, you know, first violin section with no violin. Without, with no violin. And she still performed the piece. How? And she was like, she was moving her body. She was smiling. She was, you could tell she was singing it in her head. Uh huh. And it was the best part of the show. Wow. That's so cool. It was my my favorite thing. And I was like, that is a baller performer. That person knows what's up. And like, it's genuine. Uh huh. And, and, and so there, there was something to me that I, I both, I was very satisfied with as an audience member Mm. and just as, as, as a human. And and to me is, I think sort of ties into, to, if I'm giving advice, maybe, you know, what I'm trying to say, but I think, or just in acknowledging the things that I think have worked for me and the reason I don't think I was, or actually I'm pretty sure I wasn't asked to be a part of wild up because I was the best percussionist. Right. Because there are dozens, if not hundreds, but definitely dozens of percussionists in L.A. who are a better percussionist than I am. Well, and that's Uh, the thing that I think we really all need to reflect on is that there's there's tons of people who can do what you do on your instrument well, you know. Oh, yeah. And and way better than, than, than I could. Yeah. So how do you make yourself individual? Well, you've definitely done that, you know? I mean, yeah, that's really I, the question I, for everybody to ask themselves, I think. Yeah. And, and I think truly part of, in, in any, of, of anything, the, the real reason that both I got asked to be in Wild Up and then later, uh, so I had mentioned that that concert first take with Wild Up and the opera company, it was, it was, I genuinely think it was because like, oh, Jody was a delight to work with. He like made the room better or like lit up the room or whatever it was, or, or like, because I was, you know, willing to help set up chairs or because I also made the parts and made them all the, whatever it was, I was involved in these other ways. And as a performer, the energy that I brought to the room was desirable. Mm-hmm. Whether or not I made the right notes is, is a question. And I think on, on that day, I hopefully did. Um, but I think I, you know, when, when uh, I was bummed, I, I missed a, a performance that Wild Up had a, a few years ago that uh, premiering a piece that Chris Roundtree wrote. Um, and fortunately and unfortunately, I was uh, on tour in Europe at the time with, with Bedroom Community, which was amazing in its own whole thing. But one of, I know one of the reasons that Chris was bummed to not have me as a performer on that show wasn't because again, not because I was the best percussionist in the room, but because he knew that when I lifted the mallet and then hit the crap out of the bass drum, I would hit the crap out of the bass drum and, and look like I was having the best time doing it. Mm. How could I not? Like, if you're on, I mean, one, any stage, but if you're at Disney Hall and you're getting to hit a bass drum, that is the coolest, most fun thing in the world. Like, that's so exciting. And so I think that's the thing that that's part of what comes out of me as a performer is not, am I going to hit this at the right time? It's like the, how I'm going to hit it, not only my intention behind it, but just like the genuine joy and performativity that comes along with it. Right. Um, And and you know, um, Christopher and I talked about that on his um, episode because he was talking about how important it is for him when he seeks out musicians for Wild Up, like yeah. that they're having a good time, that they bring good energy to the group, that they get along with people, obviously, that there's good energy and good vibes. And I, and it's just, it's part of the disruptive um, aspect of, of the musicians like, like him who are, and you, who are, are changing classical music, if you even want to call it classical, but like the, it's, I would, I would put it in the loosely defined genre of classical now because it's musicians who are trained in that way, like you guys, and then you're doing something different. And, um, now when it's musician led and musician founded, you can Mm. actually say, guess what? We actually want to play with people that we like, that we, that we jive with, that we have good energy with. It's, part of what we actually want as creators and artists, you know, I mean, that's one of the biggest reasons to do it. Not to say that 
if you get a job in an orchestra, you won't get lucky and you have a great section. That happens a lot, but the opposite also happens a lot, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's really great. It's really, it's really cool that that's, it's, it's becoming a thing that, Mm. that, that, um, that you enjoying your instrument on stage is actually making you (laughs) someone who might be more likely. And obviously that's not the only reason why you play with wild up, but it, he brought that up on, and it was a pertinent point in the podcast because I was like, that's really refreshing and cool that that is considered, you know, I've heard people who aren't classical musicians say to me like, Oh, when I go to the orchestra, people look people up there, looks like they're not having fun or whatever, mm. you know? So, yeah. And, and that, and that could be for various reasons, whether it's cause they're counting 104 exactly. measures of breast <laughs> or, you know, and waiting for their one whole note to come in yeah. or just cause, you know, it's just a gig or cause right. they're not getting paid enough or they don't enjoy the people enough or whatever it is. Right. Um, yeah. And, and so I feel very fortunate that I, I'm in a position where, you know, there, there is a, a space for me. And then also at, at some points, like, you know, while the a show the other night, there were two percussionists on it. I was not one of them. And I was very happy not to be, mm. um, cause the music would have been, I could have pulled it off. But there are other people who can play that music, you know, play Andrew Norman's music way better than I could in playing, you know, 10 different percussion instruments and right. um, and are just so much more trained for that in that it's not going to, I'm not going to do that part the best service and it's not going to do me the best service. Um, but still, you know, I get roped into the concert by hitting play on QLab to trigger, you know, some playback stuff. Mm-hmm. and I'm like in the room and still get to be a part of it, but I'm not stressed out by playing the percussion part. <laughs> but then on, you know, on the next show I'm playing percussion and singing and doing all the things that I do because that, that show calls for me. Right. Uh, and it makes sense to, to have me do that. And actually in a way that it doesn't make sense to have anybody else do it. Right. Um, and so there's something that, you know, it can, if, if you don't have that, it can be hard to find, but I feel lucky enough that I have that and hopefully you know it'll it has one has generated enough work so far but will continue to generate work um in a way that you know my goal would be that you know almost I have a fantasy of like you know never auditioning for anything Mm. Uh, one just because I think auditions are stressful and whatever but also just you know and I, I would love you know there are plenty of things that I totally would audition for but just conceptually i like the idea of somebody saying hey jody do you want to be a part of this because i want you right not because i want a tenor not because i want a percussionist not because i want blah 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 but because like i'm the one and 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 i think in certain circumstances i'm i'm able to to do that where you know i can sing in an opera because somebody wants me because i can you know read music well enough as a vocalist and also because I don't sing with an operatic tone. So they like want opera or like new music, but they also want kind of like an indie rock singer vibe. Right. Uh, And so, so you really created uh, yourself into a category of one in which someone might say this for this, we need Jody Landau. And I think, I think that would, that would be a great goal for anybody to have, you know, like the person that needs to do this is this person, you know, it's like you, if you needed a a rock singer and you're like, I want Sting, you're not going to say, Hey Sting, can you, can you audition? Like you just know because of the reputation and the, the body of work, that's the person we need for this thing. Right. So yeah, I, I think that's a great goal to have. It's a great goal to have. I love it. It's so much more po- empowering than I. I want to win, go win an audition because that the power is not is not in your hands, but as much as what you're yeah. describing. You know, I mean, you don't have and the and power to have somebody choose you like that. But by creating yourself as this, what you do that's so specific, you're going to be the one who they think of when they want a specific thing, and that's that's great because there's no competition in that. Yeah. And and I think certainly that, you know, I did have my moments and if we're coming back to like, maybe the, if I could find some more concrete way of like giving advice, advice. Um, but I think, 
you know, there was definitely a certain point, and I still do it, of just introducing myself to people and, like, kind of offering myself to them. Yeah. You know, of, of just putting things out there of, like, whether that's, hey, would love to work together or, like, you let me know if you need help moving chairs. Um, you know, I say that less now, but there are times when I'm like, I want to be in this room. I will do, I don't care. Like, I'm happy to just sit and listen or if you can use me either as a musician or in, in some way, I know that I want to be a part of this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in many regards, I feel grateful that I've been able to put myself in those rooms or have access to those rooms or to those people. Yeah. And Um, you also have to be somewhat outgoing, I would say. I mean, if you're a total introvert listening to this going, there's no way I would walk up to someone and say, I want to be a part of this, whether that means listening or moving chairs or being a musician in your, you know, like, so maybe that would require some diving deep for someone who does, who sound thinks that that sounds mortifying to do but exactly but, which you know yeah there, there's some work involved yeah. in that which like for me wasn't a thing I had to even work on that much yeah like I I like people I'm not afraid for the most part to introduce myself to people yeah I'm I'm pretty outgoing um you know I like to chat I like to listen um so th- that that certainly helps yeah um um, but certainly there are, there are ways of, of, of cultivating that for absolutely. sure. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me, um, what do you have coming up that you want to promote? Sure. Um, well, uh, at the moment I'm about to head out on tour with wild up. Um, and we're, uh, going to be in Utah and North Carolina and Sonoma. Um, and then, uh, later in, in, uh, in the later half of this year and going into 2020, um, I am working on a project that I'll be presenting um, that right now is around uh, the loose title of Performance of Self. Um, it's a project that I've been I'm developing with Beth Morrison Projects, mm-hmm. um, which started with sort of a push um, from from Beth of saying, you know, what would it what would it mean to take your music and your performance and push it toward theater? Um, so I don't think it's quite an opera. Um, but uh, is like sort of a performance art piece or concert um, that'll involve music and electronics and lights and projection and dance and speech. Um, uh, and, and will be a lot about um, ideas of, of what it is to perform the, sel- the self mm-hmm. um, and what it is to perform myself, both as a performer um, on stage and also off stage as well. Um, and sort of the the narratives that we or that I construct um, and sort of a, a retelling of stories and a questioning of like what it is to retell one's own stories and narratives and and if we and if I need need be bound to to that or such things um, and so it's a lot about uh, identity and queerness and sexuality and uh, consent and communication and relationships and costume and drag um, and, you know, self-preservation and self-care versus, you know, conforming, contorting to someone else's desires um, and storytelling and a, and a whole host of things. Um, Sounds great. So that, that, yeah, so that project will be uh, sorting itself out over the next several months um, and into... Um, hopefully the fall, um, we'll be doing workshops and performances and hopefully a premiere in January, 2020. Um, but I have more, uh, specifics all I won't be able to announce till a later date. So Um, can people follow you and, and kind of get updates on that somewhere? You're on Instagram, I know. Yeah. Uh, Um, Instagram is a, is a good place. Um, if, if you're on Instagram, uh, my website, jodylandau.com, J-O-D-I-E-L-A-N-D-A-U.com, um, is always a good place. I try to keep my events and all up to date. Um, and certainly any, any big events of mine like that, um, will, will be on there. Um, and as well as there, there, you know, are links to my music, um, both in audio form and some, some videos as well. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll make sure all that's linked. And when you have big, I'm, I'm totally happy to share, you know, tag me, 
when something gets launched, like especially the big one, um, yeah. I'll, I'll share it. I'm happy to share stuff too because it's fun to just spread the word about um, everything that people that I've interviewed are doing because I like to That's great. Kind of check back with people and see because it's fun to hear, you know, what you have coming and then find find it later, you know, when that actually comes up. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jody. I'm really looking yeah, forward to um, seeing what what more that you create because I really loved hearing you perform when you were here at the museum and it was so much fun to hear and I just love what you do. So thank you so much for being on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And I'm, I'm glad you were there and I, I loved, loved doing, doing those shows. It was so great. So thanks for being on. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. You too. Thanks.